Okay, good morning. So, today I want to share with you my year verse, my anchor pulled up from scripture and let down again and again and again whenever I need the strength and security of God's word. But I should warn you, my verse is a little bit different from some of the verses that we've been looking at over the last few weeks. It does give me a sense of strength and security, but that sense lies on the far side of some other and quite different feelings. Feelings of being challenged, feelings of being disturbed, even of being afraid. Let me take you to the end of Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 8. At this point, Jesus has been crucified, and the women have returned to his tomb to anoint his body with spices. To their astonishment, the tomb is empty, except for a young man dressed in a white robe. And he tells them not to be alarmed. He tells them that Jesus has risen, and he tells them that they must go and deliver this news to the disciples. And then we reach verse 8, my year verse which reads, Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now we're all fans of scripture here, I'm sure. But I think it's safe to say that this particular verse isn't going to appear on very many inspirational posters against pictures of sunsets and cute kittens hanging from branches and that kind of thing. And here's the really surprising and shocking thing. If you look up this verse in your Bible, or if you look at the few verses that often follow it, you probably see a footnote, which will tell you that according to some of the church fathers and the great majority of contemporary biblical scholars, this verse, verse eight, the verse that reads, trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. This verse was the final verse and the original ending to Mark's gospel. Now, to be clear, there are some people who dispute this, and I don't think it's difficult to see why. If verse 8 is the original ending of Mark's gospel, then it is certainly a very abrupt ending. Perhaps it's even a bit harsh, a bit hard, perhaps a little pessimistic even. Where's the joy? Where's the hope? Where's the appropriate, faithful response to God's great and generous gift? Now, I don't know if verse 8 really is the original ending of Mark's gospel or not. I'm not qualified to comment on that. But I sort of hope that it is. Because I actually really like this verse. And I think it's a very important verse. And its importance only stands out all the more if it is the original ending. So let me tell you why I like it so much. There was a time, some years ago now, when to my great surprise and bewilderment, and I really can't emphasize how surprised and bewildered I was, I quite suddenly became deeply interested in Christianity. Ideas and symbols that had once been meaningless to me, that I had thought were absurd, even repulsive, began to take on a sense of depth and richness. And I began to see them as meaningful, and then as beautiful, and then finally as necessary, as something I needed in my life, as something I couldn't and didn't want to live without. And this was all very confusing to me because I had no idea why it was happening. But at some point I thought to myself, okay, am I supposed to be a Christian? Is that the message? Am I supposed to give myself to Christ? I mean, I can be a little bit slow on the uptake sometimes. So I have to admit it, at the time I was just very confused. I wasn't sure. So I thought to myself, maybe I should read one of the Gospels and see what it's all about. And I thought, I know, I'll read Mark because it's nice and short. And if I don't like it, I won't have wasted very much time. I mean, I was interested in God, but, you know, I had things to do. Now, of course, I was quite, quite wrong. Mark's Gospel was not a short read, because once I started reading Mark's Gospel, I never really stopped. 
And I think for me at least, that's one of the particular characteristics of Mark's gospel. It strips everything back to the basics and it prompts us to ask the fundamental questions. And in particular, it prompts us to ask the most fundamental question of our faith. Who is Jesus? This is the central question of Mark's gospel, and it's repeated over and over again in one form or another all the way through the text. It's like a drumbeat, or perhaps better yet, a heartbeat, beating out the essential rhythm of Mark's gospel. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And as it beats, it builds and it builds. So, for example, early on, we hear the people ask, what is this? Talking about the teaching of Jesus. Then later we hear the disciples ask, who is this? And later still, we hear Jesus ask the disciples, who do you say I am? So it's building and building, and it's coming closer and closer. And then we reach this incredible and surprising moment in chapter 16, when we discover that the tomb is empty and we're told that he has risen. And we have to ask ourselves, do we believe this? Did this really happen? And if we do believe it, then really, who is Jesus? And now it's not who do the people say he is, or who do the disciples say he is, but who do you say he is? And I genuinely think this is truly incredible, because it's Mark himself, an ancient author, one of the earliest Christians, someone who knew the disciples personally, speaking directly to us, to each one of us, pointing at you and saying, you, yes, you, this is your moment of decision. Who do you say Jesus is? And I think that as we read about the women running away in fear and telling no one, we're supposed to feel a kind of panic, as if we want to say, no, wait, this isn't how this is supposed to end. They shouldn't be ruled by fear. They should tell people that the tomb is empty. They should be witnesses to the good news. And again, I think this is like Mark pointing at us and saying, okay, if they shouldn't run away in fear and tell no one, then what are you going to do about it? It's time to make that decision. Who do you say Jesus is and what are you going to do about it? Basically, he's saying it's over to you. If this is Mark's original ending, then he's saying, okay, if you want this story to end well, then it's up to you. You need to go out and by your action, give it an appropriate ending. Now, I can honestly tell you, when I first read that verse, it nearly knocked me off my chair. I think it's incredible. Here I am, in all my 21st century sophistication, being directly addressed and directly challenged by a man, long dead, who lived in the dusty backwater of the Roman Empire, writing nearly 2,000 years ago. I think that's amazing. But I could easily identify with these women, running away in fear and telling no one. I mean, for one thing, I think God can be a bit scary. I remember about 12 years ago, I had the great good fortune to visit the French Alps. And, you know, I come from England. England is not famous for its mountains. It's quite a flat place for the most part. So when I climbed up the side of a mountain in the Alps and I reached a ridge far, far up, and then I looked down into the valley below, my mind simply fell to pieces because I had never seen a landscape that had such colossal dimensions and such mind-bending angles. I'd never seen a depth so deep as that valley. And I had never seen rock formations so massive and majestic. And my brain simply couldn't process it. And in the overpowering sense of vertigo that this created, I became afraid. Now, I was in no real physical danger, but I felt like the valley was so deep that its very depth could just pull me off the side of that ridge and swallow me up. And it was embarrassing, but I had to sit down on the ground just to feel like I wasn't teetering at the top of a 100-foot ladder or something like that. And I had to sit there until my eyes, my brain, my mind could process this imposing, monumental and fantastic scene before me. And I think, for some of us at least, that's what it's like to come to realize, for the first time, 
that there really is a God. Because if you're not used to that idea, if you've been raised in an environment as I was, where the idea of God was dismissed or downplayed, then you're not ready to process it. You suddenly find yourself in a landscape that is far, far deeper than you ever realized it was. And that is infinitely higher and infinitely richer. You feel dumbstruck by the majesty and the glory that surrounds you. And you get a kind of spiritual vertigo. You have to sit down. Because how else are you supposed to feel except just a little bit terrified? I don't think it's that God wants us to be afraid. Pretty well much any time an angel appears to anyone in the Bible, the first thing the angel says is, do not be afraid. The young man in the empty tomb who tells the women to spread the good news, probably himself an angel, also says, do not be afraid. But I think the reason for this is that while God doesn't want us to be afraid, it's a pretty natural response for limited, finite creatures like us when we suddenly find ourselves on a ridge that looks directly out onto the infinite glory of God. Maybe this is why the first proverb in the book of Proverbs tells us that fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's a normal and natural place to begin from. If God is greater than all we can think and say, then who should come into the presence of God and not be afraid? At least a little bit, at least to begin with. So I think fear is a perfectly understandable first reaction. But as the book of Proverbs says, it's just the beginning of wisdom and faith. In time, our fear turns to awe, and our awe turns to love. As all those angels who say, do not be afraid, are trying to tell us, as awesome as God is, God is also love, and God loves us. We have a wonderful, bewildering relationship with this infinite being and creator of all things. God loves us so much that God wants us to live fully in God's truth, God's goodness, and God's beauty. But for me, that's where the real problem starts. You see, when I read chapter 16, verse 8, in Mark's gospel for the first time, I wasn't just afraid and just like the women because I was encountering God and coming to realize that God really does exist. I had another reason to be afraid. Here's Mark asking me who I think Jesus is and challenging me to rescue the end of the story by going out and doing what the women were not doing, bearing witness. But that means that this question about Jesus isn't just a mere question of opinion. Rather, it's a revolutionary, life-changing decision. A decision that threatens to turn our whole world upside down and leave absolutely nothing the same as it was before. Because once you've made that decision, we can't just go back to being who we were. We can't just go back to living life in exactly the same way that we were living before. Believing in God, believing in Jesus, comes with consequences. For one thing, it means loving our neighbor, no matter how much our neighbor might annoy or irritate us. It means loving our enemies, no matter how much hatred, resentment, or violence has passed between us. It means loving the poor, helping the needy, and doing the right thing, no matter what the right thing is, or how much it costs us. And it means learning humility, forgiveness, and thankfulness. It means that nothing will be the same again. And that sounds like quite a lot, frankly. I mean, it would be easier to not believe in God, right? I find it a lot easier to just be annoyed at my neighbor, to hate my enemy, and blame all my troubles on someone else. It's a lot easier to just think of myself and always assume that I'm right, no matter what the issue is. And it's a lot easier to stop caring about people. I mean, I could go back to spending my free time watching Netflix instead of praying or reading scripture or worrying about other people's problems. And I definitely have more time on a Sunday morning, that's for sure. And I don't know about you, but that would be very, very easy for me because I am naturally a remarkably selfish, grumpy, and irritable person. So all of that sounds pretty good to me. And it sounds like a box of donuts to somebody on a diet, basically. So when I read verse 8, 
I was also afraid because I knew, I knew that if I thought about who Jesus is and I decided that he actually is the living incarnation of divine and ultimate truth, divine and ultimate love, then nothing would be the same again. And I couldn't just go back to being selfish and grumpy and irritable and sleeping in on a Sunday morning. If God is real and Jesus is the Son of God, then that meant that I ought to be, had to be, a disciple of Christ. Not someone who merely contemplates being a disciple of Christ or who stands on the sidelines and watches while others make the necessary and difficult sacrifices but someone who is a disciple of Christ, someone who makes those necessary and difficult sacrifices, someone who does all of those things that are not easy. And for that reason, just like the women, I was afraid. And to be fair to the women and myself, we're not alone in this. C.S. Lewis, the famous writer, probably best known for his Narnia series of fantasy novels, also felt something like this. There's a famous moment that he describes in his autobiography. He's in his rooms at Oxford University and it suddenly hits him that he can't deny it any longer. He suddenly realizes that there really is a God. He writes, you must picture me alone in that room in Magdalen, night after night, feeling whenever my mind lifted, even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet, that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. So he desired not to meet God. He was afraid to admit that God was real. And when he did admit it, he felt dejected and reluctant. In one of his Narnia books, The Silver Chair, he dramatizes these emotions when he depicts a young girl, Jill Pole, lost, alone in a strange wood and desperately looking for water. She finds a clear, inviting stream and goes to drink from it, but then stops dead in her tracks because beside the stream there is a great lion, Aslan, who for Lewis represents Jesus. And Aslan is at once both wonderful and terrifying. Are you not thirsty, said the lion. I'm dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could I, would you mind going away while I do, said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. There is no other stream. We might be afraid of the risk that comes from drinking from that stream, but there is no other stream. And there can be no access to the living water of Christ if we're not willing to follow the way of Christ, if we're not willing to die to our old ways, take a risk, be transformed through true discipleship, and have our world turned utterly upside down. Elsewhere, Lewis wrote, God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. There is no other stream but God's stream. There is no other living water but Christ's. There is no other salvation but the salvation that comes from this God of love and self-sacrifice. So Lewis felt afraid, dejected and reluctant on that evening when he came to realize that God is God. 
because he knew that with this realization, his old life was over. And now he would have to love his neighbor. Now he would have to love his enemy. Now he would have to love the poor, help the needy, and do the right thing, no matter what the right thing was or how much it cost him. And now he would have to learn humility, forgiveness, and thankfulness. And that is a lot, but there is no other stream. It seems that to believe in God simply means that nothing will be the same again. And I do think that that is scary, but the reward is great. If only we have the courage to accept it. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a Lutheran pastor who led the German Christian resistance against the Nazis in the 1930s and 40s said, there is no way to peace along the way to safety. For peace must be dared. It is the great venture. So just to finish off, I want to make a small confession. I'm now sure that I know the answer to the question, who is Jesus? But as far as Mark's other question goes, what are you going to do about it? I'm still a bit afraid of that one. I'm still a bit afraid of what it means to say that Jesus is God and Jesus is Lord and that the only way forward is through discipleship in Christ because, let's be honest, we all know what happened to Jesus. And that's why I picked this verse as my year verse. The verse acknowledges that fear, but it doesn't leave us there because it challenges us to face our fear, to proclaim Jesus, live as disciples, and do the difficult but right thing. And in so doing, open up a path to a fuller and more flourishing life, a life in which we share in the very life of God. And so I need Mark every day through my ear voice to do what he does best, to point directly at me and challenge me and say, who do you say Jesus is and what are you going to do about it?